I'm going to start by introducing Judith Suisa, who's um, on, the left, on, my, on, on the left of the stage. And Judith is Professor of Philosophy of Education at UCL Institute of Education. Her work explores the intersections between political ideas and educational theory and practice. She's published widely on radical and anarchist education, parent-child relationships, and questions of belonging and identity. Her publications include Anarchism and Education, a Philosophical Perspective, and with Stefan Ramakers, The Claims of Parenting in 2012. After seeing Helen Steele being attacked at the Anarchist Book Fair in 2017 and wondering what the hell was going on, which is something we all wonder all the time, I think, um, she began to be concerned about the political erasure of sex. Since then, she's written several papers, some together with Alice Sullivan, about academic freedom and the so-called gender wars. She's no longer invited to speak at anarchist events, but she is invited to speak in Wales tonight. So, Judith. <laughs> Thank you, and thank you, Joe. Um, so I was uh, trying to prepare my notes for what I was going to talk about tonight. I, I did give Joe a title, and I've somewhat departed from that, because while I was reflecting and trying to prepare my talk, I started thinking that this is the third such panel that I've spoken at in the last six months, and it struck me how different preparing for a talk like this is from preparing from, for a talking at any other academic event, of which I've done many in my academic career, and how depressingly familiar some of the features of these events are becoming. So once again, I found myself, instead of writing my talk, I found myself having to devote a lot of time and energy to thinking about how to explain things that shouldn't really need explaining and also how to explain what I'm not saying to people who seem determined to interpret simple statements as meaning something other than what we mean by them. And also, once again, as in these other events, I find myself, instead of writing a thoughtful philosophical essay, just getting really angry. Um, and here we are on International Women's Day, and I think there is a lot to be angry about. Um, I try to show this in this slightly tongue-in-cheek slide, so there is, I try to put things to be angry about on one side and things to celebrate on the other, um, because I'm really bad with PowerPoint. The, the bit about the 22 out of 193 countries of the female head of state, well, that was supposed to be in the middle, because you could see that as something to celebrate, because <laughs> it's progress, right? Um, and it's, it doesn't say only 22 out of 193 countries. I got this from the UN you know, website. So depending, anyway, that, that's just a... <laughs> Slightly tongue cheek slice. So, so there is a lot to be angry about, and there's also a lot to celebrate on International Women's Day. What we should be focusing on, I think, is celebrating the progress that has been made around the world towards achieving greater equality and justice for women in political representation, in education, the workforce, and healthcare, and reminding everybody about the shocking inequalities that still exist. And, of course, standing in solidarity with the amazing women around the world who are at the forefront of political battles for justice, such as the girls and women who are, as we speak, taking to the streets in Kabul to demand basic freedoms at huge personal cost. But instead of joining these campaigns and supporting these women, again and again we find ourselves having to state the bloody obvious, that when we talk about women's rights, the need for women's spaces women's representation, we're talking about women as a sex class. Apparently, this is a terribly dangerous thing to say. And so not only do we have to waste time stating it and explaining why it's important, we also then have to waste time explaining how it is not hateful to say it and pointing out that merely acknowledging a conflict of rights is not unreasonable, that in fact conflicts of rights occur the whole time. And the thing to do in a democracy is to work out how to resolve them, not pretend that they don't exist. And then, then we have to waste further time explaining to people who say we're making a big fuss about nothing that yes, actually this does really matter and there are real consequences in terms of women's safety. For instance, ordinary women who want to play sports such as rugby or vulnerable women in prison or rape survivors or teenage girls struggling with their sexuality in a homophobic culture. And so... This is just some of the sort of illustration of some of the ways in which this ideology that Joan mentioned is having real life costs for women. 
So here again is a brief comment on what, on what I'm not saying. Of course, although the tagline for this event is silencing women, we are not the ones who've been silenced. It would be ridiculous to claim that we are being silenced given that we're here and we're talking to you. But the reason that we're here is that we are the women who have carried on working in academia, speaking, writing, teaching, in spite of the attempts to intim intimidate us by disinviting us from events and academic bodies, making defamatory statements about our work, sending spurious complaints about us to our managers and refusing to share panels with us. The reason these tactics have not worked in our case, which is not to say that they have not exacted a heavy personal cost, as I think Joe's going to speak about, the reason they haven't worked is that we have one or more of the following, secure permanent contracts, seniority in our fields, and supportive managers and colleagues. Women who are younger and or on insecure contracts financially vulnerable from already marginalised groups, isolated in institutions where they don't have support, simply cannot afford to take these risks. To fail to appreciate this and to kind of equate being silenced with, ha with losing your job is to show a profound misunderstanding of how academia actually works. The kinds of opportunities for professional networking, publications, affiliations to academic organisations and invitations to high-profile events are precisely the kind of things that junior academics depend on to establish their career and obtain promotions. Some of us here today can perhaps afford to pass up these opportunities, but we would not be able to do so if we were at different stages on our academic career and within the academic hierarchy. We know that there are women out there who agree with us, but who are scared to speak out. So the silencing that we're speaking about works precisely by sending a message to them that it is more expedient to keep their heads down. And here's just a, a small sample of testimonies from early career feminist academics. This is on the website. If you go to this website, you can see dozens and dozens of similar testimonies from women in academia who are scared to speak out. Um, and we're contacted individually by women like that as well. So I'm not saying that I'm being silenced. And here's another thing I'm not saying. Well, I'm not prepared to even waste time explaining that I'm not calling for, for denying anybody's human rights or worse, causing harm to them. The people suggesting that this is what we're saying seem to be relying on one of two strategies. One is the simple strategy about of lying about what we're saying or claiming that we mean something other than what we're actually saying. And I'll come back to this in a minute. The other strategy is to point out that some of the people who agree that the material differences between males and females are real and that they matter are also arguing that these differences somehow justify the subjugation of female people, the stigmatization of non-heterosexual relationships and the imposition of narrow gender stereotypes on children. Well, I don't think you need to be a philosopher to see the flawed reasoning here. Pointing out the existence of an empirical distinction does not mean that one endorses a hierarchy between the two distinct categories being described. A just world for women is a world that acknowledges that women have distinct needs because of their sex and that arranges social institutions in ways that meet those needs while at the same time not preventing women from full participation in all areas of public life. All major feminist campaigns, from campaigns for safe access to abortion, to subsidised childcare, to affordable period products, to allowing breastfeeding in Parliament, and many more, start from this basic insight. To point out that the category female is determined by the reproductive capacity of one half of the human race is not to say that all women can or must fulfil their potential reproductive function, or that doing so is the only important role they have in society. The whole point of feminism was to acknowledge women's childbearing capacity and its effect on women's bodies and the needs it gives rise to, while not allowing women's lives to be limited by childbearing or the expectation of it. It's really not rocket science. Or to put it simply in terms that philosophers will like, believing in material reality is a necessary but not a sufficient condition for being a feminist. 
So feminist campaigns on issues such as those I just mentioned are part of broader social struggles to end discrimination against individuals for their sexuality or their refusal to conform to gender stereotypes. So to try and associate feminists like us with those who would roll back abortion rights and laws against discrimination is either grossly ignorant or part of a deliberate attempt to silence us. And this is exactly how silencing works. Because people are made to feel that even expressing an idea that sounds a bit like some of the points made by people with completely different ideological agendas is akin to endorsing those abhorrent agendas, they often choose to keep quiet. Self-censorship out of fear of being seen as a terrible person is a very effective form of silencing. Even more so in a climate where far-right populist leaders are attacking LGBT rights, women's reproductive rights and other progressive political achievements. But to refuse to ask questions about any theoretical position and to collapse all criticism of it into a single ideological framework is to play into exactly the same simplistic and dangerous us and them rhetoric of the far right. And I believe that it's precisely because of the far right backlash against the hard, rights one, hard, right, hard won rights of women and minorities that we need more freedom to have more conversations about exactly what it is we're fighting for and why. And what we are fighting for, interestingly, is the same thing that women have always been fighting for. A world in which men do not have a disproportionate amount of power and in which they do not have control over and free access to women's bodies. A world in which nobody, male or female, is restricted in their choice of how to live because of the oppressive system of gender. A precondition for engaging in this struggle is that we're able to name our reality and our experiences, that we have the words with which to do so and the spaces in which to do so. This is what feminists have always demanded and this is what they've always done. And it's frustrating beyond belief and taking away time and resources from important feminist work, as Joan was saying, I think, in her introduction, that we have to explain time and time again why this matters to people who seem to think that it's perfectly possible to carry on doing this work if we just accept that being a woman has nothing to do with the material reality of our sexed bodies and everything to do with a feeling or an identity. Well, I don't accept that, and I'm sure that our feminist forebears would have been appalled by the idea that they should accept such a nonsense. What would Sylvia Pankhurst or Sojourner Truth's speeches and work have looked like if they'd assumed that the category of women included males identifying as women? Oh, people will say, but they lived a long time ago. Societies change, words can come to mean different things. And so now I come to another thing that I'm not saying. I'm not saying that words have fixed meanings and language can't shift to reflect social ideas. But part of using a language involves paying attention to what Wittgenstein called what it makes sense to say. The fact that the phrase, a woman without a uterus, makes sense in our everyday language in a way that the phrase, a woman without a penis, or a man without a uterus, does not, is telling us something about the concepts, about our concepts and about the material reality that they name. Reality in a gendered society where we all, men and women, have to navigate the complex demands, expectations, assumptions and limitations placed on us because of our sex, can be uncomfortable. It can cause distress, anger and despair. But if we want to make our social world more just and less oppressive, we will not get very far if we refuse to name and acknowledge reality and the distinctions that make sense of it. Of course, our language is not a neutral tool. Political and moral assumptions can be reflected in the choice of words and concepts. But whose political aims are being served by conflating distinctions and erasing words that describe women as a sex class? Whose aims are served by the policing of language in our courts, our universities, our policies and our laws? The philosopher Mary Leng has spoken about the phenomenon whereby gender-critical feminists saying one thing a herd as saying another. And she's described this as a form of illocutionary disablement. In other words, the speaker is deprived of the ability to do what she wants to do with her speech. And I find Leng's analysis quite compelling and agree with it. But what she doesn't elaborate on is the sheer amount of time and energy wasted by stating the bloody obvious or explaining what it is that we're not saying, or the anger and frustration that this generates. 
And so here I am again, expending time and energy on this, feeling angry and wasting time stating the bloody obvious and explaining what it is that I'm not saying. So I don't really have time to talk about the thing that I was advertised as talking about, which is the idea of the morally unthinkable. This is an idea that's discussed by philosophers such as Raymond Gator, who use it to reject the kind of moral philosophy that proceeds by offering hypothetical scenarios or thought experiments, and then asking us to use our moral intuitions to decide what ethical action would be acceptable in such scenarios. Famously, these experiments have been used by utilitarian philosophers such as Peter, St Peter Singer to defend arguments such as, for example, that it would be morally justifiable to abort a severely disabled child if the money saved by not having to keep that one child alive could be used to save the lives of several starving children. Disability rights campaigners and others have rightly objected to the morally abhorrent implications of this kind of argument the argument that our ethical life is a kind of cold calculus of consequences and that some human lives are expendable. But feminism doesn't need to construct hypothetical moral dilemmas to make its point. To the extent that thought experiments are at all useful to us, they take the form not of asking people to con consider ethically dubious actions in a hypothetical situation, but of probing the meaning of the words and phrases that we're asked to adopt in order to describe our social reality, and challen challenging the institutions and practices that shape that social reality. So here's a thought experiment. If we brought female and male babies up in exactly the same way from birth, treated them exactly the same, gave them the same clothes and the same toys and the same career choices and talked to them in exactly the same way, would it still be possible for anyone to believe that they were born in the wrong body? Is it morally abhorrent to ask people to consider this thought experiment? I don't think so. But then what I think or say doesn't really matter to those objecting to my brand of feminism, as merely to present this will be read as me saying something else. As I said, it's exhausting. And we've been here before. Women meeting to talk about their lives, their bodies, their needs, has always been seen as a threat. At times, what they were saying was indeed a very real threat to male power, an overt threat. When the suffragettes demanded the vote, it was clear to many that giving them what they wanted would reduce some of the power men had to control women's lives and shape political institutions in their own interests. But what has really changed? In Tehran, it is the physical presence of women in the streets defying the mullahs' attempts to control their bodies and their movements that is the greatest threat to the regime. And in Wales, where women's sex-based rights are apparently being at best ignored and at worst undermined by some recent policy initiatives, it is women gathering to demand their words to describe their reality and to defend their own spaces that is apparently a threat. So our demands have not changed. A world where gender does not oppress people and where men do not have uncontrolled access to women's bodies. The demand is simple, even if we have to waste a hell of a lot of time offering all sorts of explanations about what we're not saying. The claims about the apparent danger in what we're saying get more and more hyperbolic by the day, to judge from some of the slogans of the protesters at today's protest. But really, it was always the same. It was always women getting together, talking, and it was always about men and the control they exercise over our lives. And so I ask again in conclusion, who stands to gain by silencing us and whose interests are served by policing our language? Thank you.